You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to the Catholic Mama, where you'll learn how to deepen and defend your faith, find comfort as we share the vocation of parenthood, and learn how to raise your children confidently Catholic. I'm your host, Christine Mooney Flynn. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to the Catholic Mama podcast. I'm your host, Christine Mooney Flynn, and I am joined, since it is Sunday, with my husband, Pat. Well, hello, everybody. Always a joy to be back on my very favorite podcast, (laughs) The Catholic Mama. Uh, This is just what we do on Saturday or Sunday mornings, I should say. We get the baby to sleep, the kids get to watch some kind of cartoon, and we get to have a conversation. It's very nice. Use screen time judiciously, mm-hmm. if I can say that word correctly. Judiciously. I've been up since 3 a.m., so Juicy. <laughs> I'll do the best I can. Actually, so uh, I think this is a really interesting topic that we're going to start on because while eventually we are going to get to natural family planning mm-hmm. and why the church says no to birth control, we will do that Next week, right? Sure. We'll see where it goes. We'll see yeah, see how long it gets to. But where we're going to start today with the natural law theory is something that can be applied to whatever we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Why suicide is bad. Why gay marriage isn't really marriage. Mm-hmm. Why, again, and then why birth control um, is, is not ethical. Yes. So we are kind of, we're going to lay the groundwork for Catholic ethics, correct? That's the plan. That's the plan. Mm-hmm. Whew. Strap yourselves in, everybody. Yeah. Well, this is this is a huge subject, right? I mean, huge. Uh, and oftentimes people are very curious, rightfully so, of, hey, why does the church teach this about birth control? Or why does the church teach this about sexual ethics? And I've found that it's often a lot easier to have these conversations like it is with almost anything else if you just return to first principles. If you can see the starting point from which the church reasons, and you can understand that clearly, then you can see the logical connections to any particular topic, whether it's sexual ethics, whether it's suicide, whether it's marriage, whether it's even um, with relation to the state or economics. And you already kind of mentioned that the church upholds and affirms what's known as the traditional natural law perspective on ethics. Now, I I would like you to define that because a lot of times— uh, all, of course, it's always people sh- uh, firing off random internet comments. Uh, you know, well, animals in the animal kingdom uh, behave like this way. Why can't humans? You know, that's natural. <laughs> so I want you to explain or define, if you will, natural yeah, law. Yeah, when we when we talk about the natural law, we don't mean like Mother Nature in the way that somebody who shops at like a health food store is talking about. Not that I have anything wrong with health food, <laughs> stores. Health food stores. I love health food stores, <laughs> but that's just that's equivocation. That's not what we mean. First off, the church didn't invent the natural law. Uh, it's it's a reflection of the divine and eternal law. The church just upholds it, affirms it, and tries to promulgate it. So let's be very clear about that. And natural law theory actually has uh, roots and origins in ancient Greek philosophy because it's something that you can reach through reason alone. And when we talk about nature in this sense, what we really mean are natures or essences, that there is a certain definitional content to categories of things. So for example, our nature as humans, is rational animality. That's what we are, which is very different than the nature of non-rational animals. And what we can do is by understanding the natures of things, we can understand what is really good for them, what perfects their nature, or if you don't like the word nature because it makes it confusing, their, their essence, or even more technically, their substantial form. And so when we talk about, oh, well, you know, <clears throat> you know, uh, you, you see incestual behavior in the animal kingdom all the time, uh, this, of course, is a, is is laughable because that's not what we mean by natures, and it's, it's actually specifically because we have rational animality that we can be moral agents, whereas other animals cannot be because we have a different nature than, say, a baboon or a lion. Plus, think of how ridiculous that is. On no ethical theory would somebody say, well, look, because one shark forcibly copulates with another shark, it essentially rapes it, right? Should we go around raping people? This is <laughs> we, why. On what ethical theory would you ever want to base uh, what humans should do versus what sharks or Non-rational baboons do? Animals would so do, it's yeah. a total equivocation, and and it's just it's a, it's a, it is a very common stock objection, but it completely misses the literally everything about what traditional natural law. Right. Just and it, is. and it starts with a confusion 
over when we say natural or nature. Right, the word, the word nature. So to give an example and, and a great starting text with this would actually be Aristotle, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. And he says at the very beginning that all men by nature desire to know. And that's only something that a rational animal, something with a rational nature, um, can do. And, and, it's, and this, humans have a nature that is not just different in degree, from the lower order species. It's different in kind, right? Even the smartest primate can't tell the difference syntactically between man bites dog and dog bites man. They can't form abstract concepts. They can't reason from premises to conclusions by the laws of logic. There is something radically different about humans. It's not just a matter of degree. We have a a specific difference to the to our genus of animality meaning we have rational powers we are rational animals and then when we understand that we have a rational nature we can kind of unpack what what would be good uh, for us as rational animals and what perfects a rational nature of course as aristotle is hinting at is truth so we can see it's good for us to seek truth in fact we all seek truth naturally by our very nature and so it is it is good for us it perfects us to know things, to know things as they really are and to avoid falsehoods. One of the other um, internet <laughs> um, comments that if somebody, if, if you're around the internet at all, you'll probably come across it at some point if something like natural law theory comes up, which I think it's on the same terms. But I just want to, if you ever hear this one, this is also, uh, an, as Pat says, an equivocation, um, where people say, well, you know, humans aren't don't have wings. How How are airplanes... Uh, <laughs> how are airplanes ethical? <laughs> right, or, or I'm wearing glasses. Those aren't natural, right? Yeah. So let's take the glasses one because that's that's obviously. First off, don't try and have deep philosophical conversations with people on Instagram who follow a- atheist hashtags. It's just never going to be productive, right? They're just they're, they're just not they're just not up to the game, so to speak. Um, maybe start the conversation elsewhere because you'll. I, you'll uh, but okay, so real quick, when you said that about the hashtags, just be aware too is that if you follow Catholic has- ha- hashtags, excuse me, atheists or non-Catholics who are anti-Catholic will use those hashtags to uh, try to spread their the truth of you know what they think is the truth and undermine, scandalize Catholics. So just be aware when you see these things that they they have no real basis. <laughs> Yeah, that that and, and, and just, you know, sometimes you just have to plant the seeds and then say, okay, I've done my work and now I'm going to let God do the rest. And, and you can't just expect too much of these conversations. You'll just be eternally frustrated. But let's take, let's take the glasses. Well, glasses aren't natural. Again, total equivocation. They're in, in, you know, in deeper metaphysical terms, they're an artifact. They're something that I've assembled and, and made a, and like kind of imposed a purpose on externally to the nature of the thing, the individual components themselves. But here's the thing. What is the nature of having eyes? Well, the nature of having eyes is to see. So it is good for eyes uh, to have proper vision, right? That's, that's what perfects eyes is having quality eyesight. And we say in a very real way, and this is totally legitimate, that somebody who can't see well has bad eyes. Like these are bad eyes because we understand there's something about the nature of eyes that is inherently oriented by its essence towards seeing things. And so when vision is obscured or like me, you, you have just very blurry vision, uh, I don't get offended when somebody says I have bad eyes or bad eyes. That's just true. I don't say, hey, man, that's your opinion. No, that's <laughs> that's a fact given the nature of eyes. So then what is, why are glasses good? They're good because they restore what is proper to eyes, right? So it's actually facilitating what is good and proper to eyes, which is clear vision. So it's actually perfectly in line with traditional natural law. What would be bad is if I gouged my eyes out. That would be frustrating, the nature of, 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 of eyesight, which is proper vision, nope. right? So that's just kind of where what seems like, a, a, you know, at least to people who have no idea what they're talking about, a powerful objection actually just completely turns on itself and yeah, shows, right. no, here's what we're really talking about. And this shows that glasses for many people like me are a good thing because they restore what is proper to, to yeah, eyesight. Yeah. Okay, so we, yes, thank you for uh, entertaining some of the objections <laughs> that I've seen over the past few years uh, and probably would have, you know, prior to my conversion i probably would have been like oh yeah this makes a lot of sense and (laughs) and it comes down this is why logic is important on certain fallacies like equivocation using you know a a word or a term but not the same concept for example um so that is where it's important to define terms so please i'm sorry continue and defining what natural law theory. so natural law series begins uh there's kind of two fundamental pillars for natural law these pillars philosophical pillars would be what's called essentialism that there really are essences and natures out in the world 
there really are things like triangularity or rational animality or dogness or acornness. And we can defend that in all types of ways, but it's really very much common sense. And you really need that commitment if you're going to make sense of philosophy or science at all. In fact, a lot of science is just uncovering the properties and powers that are inherent in certain natures of things. It's really kind of unpacking what the natures of things are from certain scientific perspectives. So I would argue that science is committed to essentialism, that if you want science, you need this kind of philosophical pillar. Certainly everyone assumes it, right? Um, Then the other one, which kind of extends from that, is what's known as teleology, that part of what a thing is involves what it does or what it is aiming towards. St. Thomas says that every agent acts for an end, or, or another way that we might be able to say this is every essence aims towards an effect or a range of effects in virtue of what it is. Eyes aim towards vision. Acorns aim towards becoming oak trees. Now, they don't always attain these ends for various reasons. Genetic defects, somebody eats the acorn, whatever. But within their nature, within the essence, they're always aimed toward that certain effect or range of effects. You know, eyes are never oriented towards hearing, for example, at least not in humans. Acorns never become lions. Water always has certain kind of causal properties in the way that water acts, uh, for example. And then, yep, go ahead. So if, 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 if there are components within us that have these teleological ends, eyesight, reproductive organs, feet. But then the whole human person also has its own end, which is to know, correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So the important thing to get is on natural law perspectives and and what I would say the right metaphysical view of the world is fact and value are not distinct. And a sort of stock example that can be used to illustrate this point is we take an example of a triangle or triangularity. What is the nature of triangularity? Well, it's something like a geometric figure that has three straight sides whose angles add up to 180 degrees. Great. Now we know something about the essence of triangularity. Maybe there's more to it, but it's at least that, right? Um, Then when somebody draws a triangle, and if they draw it very carefully with with a protractor and straight lines and sharp angles, we say, that's a good triangle. And then if somebody else draws a triangle on the back seat of a school bus, you know, on the way to school, it's very wavy sides, very rounded angles. We say that's a bad triangle. And, and that is an objective matter of fact or really of value based on the facts of what triangularity is. Fact and value are not distinct, right? So we can say objectively that this is a good triangle and that is a bad triangle based on our understanding of the essence of triangularity. Fact and value are not distinct. Now, that's a simple example, but the principles carry over. And once we understand that humans also have a nature and that this, this nature has, uh, in various instantiations, can have uh, a greater degree of perfection, right, in all of its forms, we could say objectively, oh, you're a good human <laughs> or, or, you're, or you're a bad human, right? And like, okay, that might be offensive to some, but here's the deal. When we understand sort of what a human is on the, in the highest principle, which is a rational animal, that what perfects us is truth. To, as Bernard de Lonergan, a famous philosopher, once said, is the human mind wants to know everything about everything. Well, what is the ultimate truth? What is the highest truth? Well, it's God, right? So ultimately what perfects us above every, anything is God. So what determines whether we've ultimately on the greatest grand scheme lived a good life is if we get to God and we find that eternal union and divine loving, saving, and understanding relationship with God and a beatific vision. That's what ultimately perfects humans on the highest principle of what we are as rational animals. But as you've hinted, uh, we are, we're rational animals. We still have other components to us, right? We have sexual components. We have other physical components. And all of these themselves have various functions, aims, and ends. Sex, uh, I, what grade did we start learning this in in fifth grade <laughs> whatever it is right is oriented towards as the catholic ch- church has always affirmed uh union and procreation union and procreation so once we understand the essence of sexual intercourse and sexual relationships we can understand what perfects that what is a good instance of that and what are perverted instances of that what are bad instances of that in the same sense that um, once we understand the essence of rationality, we can say, well, what perfects rationality? What is good reasoning? We say this all the time, is reasoning that leads to truth. And we actually say people that they're reasoning badly if they come to false conclusions. Mm-hmm. Like that's poor. Now, how can we make sense of that language unless we're committing to this type of ethical understanding of the world? So what I'm saying is if you deny this ethical understanding of the world, you, you can't even get arguments off the ground against it. Because you've denied that there's any standard that we could say somebody is reasoning well or reasoning poorly. 
So there's sort of a deep <laughs> yeah. undercutting self-defeat to even try and get out of this if you're following, if you're following me here. Um, but these are, these are really the foundations of what the Catholic Church is working on, and they're rock-solid philosophical foundations. And the Catholic Church has always just affirmed this, that there are perfections. That, and the study of ethics is really just the study of the good life. What is the good life? And ethics and morality only comes into the scene with rational animals. Um, non-rational beings, not even necessarily animals, rational beings, angels, for example, would count, but they're not animals. Um, or if there were other rational beings that weren't animals of some kind, they could still have, uh, they could still be moral agents. Um, hawks aren't moral agents. Lions aren't moral agents. Sharks aren't moral agents. That's why when we say a shark forcibly copulates with another shark, it's not raping it, right? Because morality only enters a scene when rationality enters a scene, precisely because we can consider different alternatives under different conceptual descriptions, and we can choose between alternatives under different conceptual descriptions. So we can choose to pursue one alternative over the other. And the ethical life, the ethical question is, what are the decisions that really perfect us? What are the decisions that really facilitate our highest flourishing, that really lead us to the good life? And that's only possible with creatures that have intellect and, and rationality and as a byproduct of that, the ability to choose otherwise, known as free will. So that's, that's kind of an introduction, if you will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, just <laughs> as somebody who did not have any good training in logic from any sources <laughs> when I was growing up or in school or anything like that, reasoning to me always sounded very much uh, like some, something out of Star Wars or Star Trek. Spock, you know, unfeeling, just thinks was his mind. But I love the way that you're bringing in you know, the the goodness as well, because it makes us when we're choosing what is right and what is wrong and we're we're making our moral decisions, what gets to the heart of it is trying to get ourselves to know God best. Correct. And that is really there's a, a huge heart there. It's not just thinking with the mind. Mm-hmm. It is reasoning. Mm-hmm. And acting from the heart. And not only that, but this is, you know, kind of the, the nice interplay between philosophy and theology is that you have some of the, the great thinkers in the traditional natural law or, or also kind of extends from virtue ethics as well, like Aristotle. And he, he could know from reason alone just by thinking about these things that something about our nature is oriented towards contemplating the divine, right, the highest part of our life. Now, he would have never have guessed that we could be friends with God. That's something that God had to specially reveal. Aristotle probably would have, he would just never he would have guessed that there's such an infinite distance between us and God that you could never conceive of us actually being friends with God, which wouldn't have been possible without God beco- coming here for right. us to be but, our friend. But this is where it shows that God's revelation in Christianity doesn't c- conflict with the natural law; it extends it, sure, yeah. and clarifies it and makes it even more beautiful. Right? So there's nothing about us being friends with God that's against the natural. It's just it's just that somebody like Aristotle wouldn't have gotten that far without God helping us along, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, revelation uh, illuminates the natural law in kind of s- specific instances. So from traditional natural law reasoning, um, we can get to certain virtues like justice. It's good for us. It perfects us to be just creatures in various ways. Um, but part, of, but justice is giving to another what they are owed, what is due to them by their nature and relationship to you. Well, certainly— God has given us everything, right? Like we only have anything because God gives it to us at any moment that we exist. So we owe some type of reverence and worship to God as the perfect being that he is. So traditional natural law can show that it's good for humans to be religious, to, to be reverent, and to even have some type of worship in their lives. But it, but it can only get you there in a very general way, right? But Christian revelation can come in and say, oh, now here's specifically how God wants you to have that relationship to him. Here's specifically how God wants you to relate to him. So it gives specific defined content to the general philosophical ethical deductions, if you will, in a sense like, oh, okay, God wants me to specifically uh, relate to him through the Eucharist, for example, and he wants me to keep Sundays specifically holy. You couldn't get to that from <laughs> from philosophy yeah, alone, right. but you can see how the theology of the revelation kind of fills in some of the more specific details that is perfectly compatible with the sort of philosophical analysis of it. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, the other, one more thing about that. The other thing is is God doesn't assume that most people are going to be moral philosophers. So part of the reason <laughs> that he gave us theology and revelation is just so we don't have to sit and do all this deep armchair thinking. <laughs> he makes it easy for us, right? So there's nothing illegitimate about saying God revealed himself. 
He gave us a church to guide us and protect us, and this is what the church teaches, and I can trust what the church teaches. So even if I don't understand why the church teaches this on contraception, I can still know that God wouldn't lie, he wouldn't mislead, and this, and he will only give me what is really good for me. So even if I don't understand all the philosophical underpinnings, I should still accept this teaching, and I should believe it wholeheartedly. That's, that's a very interesting point. I, I've spent a lot of time over the past week or so uh, thinking about you know my past as a New Ager type person, and um, it's God wants us to come into a freely to jo- come into a loving, knowing, saving relationship with Him. And so, while He makes the parameters of how to live that life difficult for us because we are fallen humans and to not sin is a difficult thing for us, He made it pretty e- simple mm-hmm. in a sense. You know, it's not it's not easy for us to do it. the 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 path is narrow. Uh, and the way of sin is quite a wide boulevard to stroll down. Um, but he he really, you know, he wanted to make it simple enough, and he left us with a church that is guided by the Holy Spirit. I mean, we're coming up onto Pentecost, so this is the birthday of the church. And, um, <laughs> sorry, I just did that a little baby, just give me a funny look. Um but he, uh, you know, he wants us to be in this loving, saving relationship with him. So it's not like he's hiding some of this knowledge or uh, making it difficult for us to come uh, into that that relationship with him. He, no, he no. he gave us these parameters that we just need to follow and trust. And not him. only what to do, but he helps us get it done. That's right. the thing. He not only he not only specifically delineates. This is what you're made for. You're made for me. This is how you're going to become perfect. This is how you're going to enter into that perfect, complete happiness to be perfected as a creature of love. And not only that, I'm going to help you do it, right? And all I'm asking is that you just you want you want to be perfected, right? You want to cooperate with the grace that I'm giving you. That's another, yeah, the grace because I think um, this this is based. And we'll get again. We'll get. We're going to talk about natural family planning and uh, just Catholic sexual ethics in our next episode next week. But this is coming from a listener submitted question about, you know, how this doesn't seem fair <laughs> that God is asking us to do this um, and abstain from um, sex with our spouses on certain times of the month if we don't want to have children or whatever it is. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. Yeah, well, I mean, it. so once you have the foundations, <laughs> you can see how they would extend to the sexual life. And the sexual life is just one page of many, many, many pages of what constitutes the good human life, right? Many pages on many different aspects. I mean, our lives are suffused with ethical decisions. How we eat, what we watch, how we speak, what we read, how and when we worship. This All, all of these things have to be considered because we are moral agents, so of course, you know, the sexual life is going to play a role in that. Now, in, because in contemporary contol- culture this has become so contentious, it's it's become so exaggerated in terms sure, of the headlines. Magnified, yeah. But it's important to understand that this is just one page among many, many yeah. pages of what the good life is. Yeah. And that here's the thing, if you follow this, if you if you live according to the natural law and what the church teaches, you will be better off for it. Everything is about your perfection and your flourishing. And most people know, even though that they're that, – that sin, here's what sin does. It makes you weak and stupid. We know this from scripture. <laughs> we know this from experience. Sin makes you both weak and stupid. It obscures your vision of what is really good, right? That There's a sort of like confusion and ignorance about what the good properly is, and it weakens your will to be able to refuse it. And we see this in, in various forms of sinful – inclinations and even outright addictions, whether it's with food, alcohol, pornography. And people in these situations, even though they don't want to give it up, know it's not good for them. They know on some level it's not good for them. And when they break free of that, you know, largely if not entirely because of God's grace and opening up to God's grace, they always look back and say, I am so glad that's out of my life. Yeah. And I, that's, sorry, that's what reminded me mm-hmm. is that you're not doing this alone. There's God's grace. Of course. Right. But, this isn't just like, oh, my husband and I have decided to uh, follow the church's teachings on this, uh, wish us luck. No, it's that you are opening yourself to the grace of God. And, and you know, just real quick for the sexual thing, and we can talk the deeper kind of philosophical underpinnings later, but, I mean, we can see why things like promiscuity could lead to, to other vicious behavior. One is that you're essentially using other people as instruments, as a means, rather than treating them as an end in themselves, right? You're really using them not to be too crude, but as a masturbatory device, more or less. Um, and that you could see how this could kind of roll you over into into an increasingly more narcissistic 
and addictive type of person rather than seeing the sexual act as a unification between a man and a woman, a sort of deep sacramental spiritual bonding device, if you will, that is oriented towards ushering other souls into life that you will be utterly responsible for and have to pour yourself out for, have to become increasingly more loving towards. So one sexual kind of way of living is inherently always going to be more oriented towards a giving of self, a giving away of self, not to just spouse, but even potentially children, which will increase you in the direction of love and compassion and care and responsibility. The other one is closing other people out, making you less a person of love and more a person of sort of exceeding self-interest. Mm. And we can see even just from that view how one is oriented towards what I think most people would agree is a proper perfection of human beings, right. which is loving. Certainly that's what we need if we're going to enter into the, to the, to the Trinitarian life of love is to be loving creatures sure. ourselves. The other one is in leading towards a more self-isolated, narcissistic, radically self-interested person. So we could see how it all connects in yeah. those directions as well. Mm-hmm. Do you think we've given a good enough um – or, you know, maybe some recommended reading yeah, as we so, lead off into, because next week we will, on the next episode, I, we're going to dive specifically into the sexual ethics of the Catholic that's teachings. That's right. Everybody's favorite subject. <laughs> it is. But it, is it every- needs to be talked about. Um, I think it is everybody's favorite. Everybody wants to know about this and why. And, so yeah, there are I, very, very good reasons. Let me just reasons. assure you that the best philosophical and ethical arguments support what the Catholic Church teaches on this, even if you aren't aware of them. But hopefully we can make people aware. Start with this book. If you're interested in ethics and traditional natural law, both what grounds it, how to get it off the ground, and the implications of it, great book called Right and Reason by Father Austin Fagothi. He was a, a, a ethical philosopher and a priest as well. Uh, so it's called Right and Reason by uh, Father Austin Fagothi, and it, the subtitle is Ethics and Theory and Practice Based on the Teachings of Aristotle and St. Thomas. It's a thick book. It's, it's really kind of a college-level textbook, but it's very accessible. So I I'll think, put the link in the yeah, show notes. Let's, let's start with that. Yep. So cool. Awesome. Okay. Well, everyone, uh, you have your reading for the week, and we will be back next time. Make sure that you subscribe. Hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss next week's episode or any further or future ones. And uh, everyone, God bless. Don't forget to head over to thecatholicmama.com to get your free copy of How to Talk to Your Kids About God. This handy little ebook will teach you how to broach the topic of God with your children or how to respond to your kids when they want to talk about God, as well as give you answers to seven of the trickiest questions about the faith that Christian parents face. You'll love the easy to understand grown up answers, the pared down but not talked down answers you can share with your kids, plus recommended resources if you'd like to deepen your understanding of the topic. Get yours free at thecatholicmama.com. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.